Well, good morning. Good morning. Glad to see everybody here. And as you can see, uh, with the big words behind me, and as Lance has said, we are in the Advent season, and uh, we will be celebrating that season over the next few weeks here. And if I could summarize Advent um, in just maybe a, a simple statement, I'll throw up a quote. Uh, you can't go wrong with this guy. I think of him as the Christian Yoda. His name's Tim Keller. Uh, he's a pastor in New York City, and so if you know anything about Tim Keller, it's always good. So I figure why not start with somebody good, so if you fall asleep, it's just down. All right. So Tim Keller says this, um, God truly understands you from inside your experience. There's no other religion that says God has suffered, that God has to be courageous, and that he knows what it's like to be abandoned by friends, to be crushed by injustice, to be tortured and die. Christmas, or Advent, shows that God knows what you're going through, and I'd say this very moment, when you take to him, he understands. If I could summarize Advent, that would probably be a good way to put handles on Advent, that God has is entered in, and we have this long expectant hope that God would enter in and truly understand us. And so we will be in this Advent season this week and for the coming weeks of December. Uh, let's just start in Isaiah 9-6. We'll take the first name that's in this set of four names. As Lance had mentioned, there's a set of four names or titles in Isaiah 9-6. We get Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of peace. And the first one is what we will look at today, and that's Wonderful Counselor. And so my question is, why is Wonderful Counselor even in this list, and why is it first? If you came to me with this list of four, and you said, Stephen, you've got one sermon to preach, and out of these four, you got a three-point sermon, I would eliminate probably Wonderful Counselor, and I would give to you Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, because with Mighty God and Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace, you get this idea of someone who's over our situation, right? Someone who stands over Mighty God, right? Father, someone who overlooks a family, who's in charge of a family. A prince, someone who rules over an area, someone who has a kingdom. And so I want you to imagine with me for a moment, maybe uh, this time of year you get Christmas cards, right? But let's just imagine this time of year your cousin sends you a card with a birth announcement of their firstborn child. And the card has a picture of the cute little baby. And uh, there it is wrapped in, well, I don't know, it's wrapped in a little blanket and it's, it's smiling, it's cute, it's not the little snot shooter that it's going to be. It's a little, and, and right next to it says, hello, in all caps and bold. And right next to that, underneath it, it says, we are happy to announce that to us, a child is born, Jeffrey, William, Will, Bill. You would think, what? They gave this kid four names? I couldn't decide on a name? What in the world? I mean, I can understand William, Will, Bill. What's up with Jeffrey? It doesn't fit. What's going on here? These, this poor kid has no shot at life. He's got four names, and he's already doomed. Poor kid, right? And you look at that card, and you would just shake your head. In this situation, wonderful counselor doesn't seem to fit. It doesn't seem to fit with the other three, so why stick it in this list? Well, in order to understand why Wonderful Counselor is in this list, you've got to understand uh, where we are in the book of Isaiah, okay? So in Isaiah, it's a really big book. It's like 60 some odd, 66 chapters long. It's very long. It's long. Um, it's divided into two main sections, chapter 1 through 39, and then chapter 40 through the end. And in this little part here, we have Isaiah 6.1. And it ends, the section ends right where we are today in Isaiah 9, 6. And Isaiah 6, 1 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Okay, so there's this vision of God in the midst of the death of a king. And Isaiah 9, 6 is going to end this section with the hope of God in the midst of the birth of a son, the birth of a child. And the hope is that this child will fix the problem that has been lingering. Look in Isaiah 9, 7. 
It says, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. When a king dies, is there peace in the land? No. When there's a presidential transition, is there peace in the land? No. This is a tumultuous time in Isaiah's life. Things are really, really upside down and uh, worrisome right now. And, of course, you have on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it. Well, the problem is the kingdom of David is not established. You have in this chapter here that the people of God are divided in chapters 7 and 8. Okay, so what you see is that there's a big division among Israel, among the people of God. The kingdom is not established, it's split. And it's not just split, there's massive hostility. If you look in Isaiah 9, 5, you see descriptions, words used like this, for every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult, every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. That is not a summary of the day you want to have tomorrow, right? I mean, that is, that is, things are very bad. And in this middle section, you have King Ahaz, bad dude, okay? He's a bad king. He's the leader of the southern king, kingdom of Israel, what we will call Judah, okay? So a little history lesson for you here. Israel has a, a, a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Ahaz is in charge of the southern kingdom called Judah. And he gets word that the northern kingdom called Ephraim, or what will be known as Israel, is in league with Syria, a pagan nation, to come down on them and crush them. Civil war. Civil wars always have this weird tendency of being north versus south. I don't know what that is. I don't know why. But... It is what it is, okay? So the northern kingdom has teamed up with a pagan nation, and they're coming against their own flesh and blood. They're coming against Ahaz, and Ahaz hears this. And if you look in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 2, you'll see the effect that this has on Isaiah. Isaiah 7, 2. When the house of David was told Syria is in league with Ephraim, so there it is, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of the people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. So here's a little history lesson for you. The events in this uh, chapter took place about 2,700 years ago. So not too long ago. 2,700 years ago. 200 years before that, Israel splits into two kingdoms. So about 2,900 years ago, let's just call it around even 3,000 years ago, Israel has 12 tribes, okay? And they split. Ten go to the northern kingdom, two go to the southern kingdom. And those groups, known as Ephraim in the north, you see that in 7-2, the southern kingdom, two tribes in the south, known as Judah. So you have Israel and Ephraim in the north, Judah in the south. Okay, you got that? Kind of that picture there? So how did they split? Well, Israel was unified under King David. King David, good dude. When you talk about David as king, anyone who knows Jewish history thinks glory days. Okay? David was a good dude, even though he did some pretty shady things. All right? He murdered somebody, cheated on his wife. The Bible still calls him a man after God's own heart. Wow, there's hope for us, okay? <laughs> David, David had united the kingdom. The kingdom of Israel was one under him, okay? But David has a son named Solomon, okay? Solomon, as you know, uh, was kind of a wise guy, but he was also, we'll call him Shaky Solomon, Okay, we'll call him Shaky Solomon because, well, he, uh, he really kind of started to mess things up with the kingdom of God. Things started to get shaky with Solomon. And there was a guy who served underneath Solomon. His name was Jeroboam. Jeroboam was kind of his right-hand man, but he also was starting to do some conspiracies underneath Solomon and starting to kind of get some people under his own team to revolt against Solomon. Solomon finds out, and Jeroboam, well, we'll call him Jetty Jeroboam, okay? Jetty Jeroboam jets down to Egypt. 
he flees for his life. Okay? Well, time goes on, and Solomon dies, and Solomon has a son named Rehoboam. Very creative names these people had. Jeroboam, Rehoboam, okay? Rehoboam now becomes king, and guess who shows up? Jedi Jeroboam comes up, all right? And I want, I want us to read in 1 Kings 12, 1 through 14. If you want to flip to it, it might also be on the screen behind me. This is 1 Kings 12, and I'm going to read to you because there's some pretty cool, like, 300-style stuff going on here. Like, I said 300, and all the dudes are like, what? Yeah, all right, all right. Yeah, abs. All right, so 1 Kings 12, 1. Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. And as soon as Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, another great name, heard of it, for he was still in Egypt where he had fled from King Solomon. Remember I told you he fled, he's jetty, he jetted. Then Jeroboam returned from Egypt, and they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel came and stood before Rehoboam. And here's what they said to him. Your father Solomon made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke on us, and we will serve you. And he said, and Rehoboam said to them, go away for three days and come again to me. And so the people went away. I don't think it was the entire nation. That had kind of been weird, like, hey, you guys just go away, and then like millions of people march away. I think it was kind of like the leaders of the people. They all marched away. Then King Rehoboam, now I want you to notice as I read this next section, what word shows up a handful of times, okay? Then King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men who had stood before Solomon, his father, while he was yet alive, and he said, how do you advise me to answer these peop this people? And they said to him, if you will be a servant to this people today and serve them and speak good words to them when you answer them, they will then be your servants forever. Some gray-haired experiential wisdom. And everyone who fits that description said, amen. Okay, there we go. All right, all right. We're a young church. Uh, but he... but." <laughs> but Rehoboam abandoned, here it is, the counsel that the old men gave him and took counsel with the young men who had grown up with him. So what did he do? He went to an echo chamber. He got on Facebook. He got all his dudes that he used to go and do all kinds of crazy stuff with. And he was like, hey, what you think I should do now that dad's dead in this kingdom? And here's what they said to him. And he, he said to them, what do you advise that we answer this people who have said to me, lighten the yoke that your father put on us? And the young men who had grown up with him said to him, thus shall you speak to this people who said to you, your father made our yoke heavy, but you lighten it for us. Thus you shall say to them. So here's what they, here's their counsel. Here's their advice. My little finger, my little finger is thicker than my father's thighs. <laughs> and now, whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips. I'm going to give you scorpions. Yeah. Hey, Ray and Bone, that'll go over great, man. <laughs> you think it went over great? No. No. So Jeroboam, three days later, comes, and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king said. Come to me again the third day. The king answered the people harshly and forsaking what? The counsel that the old men had given him. He spoke to them according to the counsel of the young men, saying, My father, here it is again, made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. And what do you think happened? Whoop. Split. It took ten tribes up to the north, two tribes to the south remain, and the kingdom of Israel was split at that point because of why? Foolish counsel. Bad folly. Dumb advice. Bad advice hurts people. When someone comes to you for advice, 
actually think, is this going to be helpful? <laughs> because bad advice hurts people, and it split this country into civil war. What was needed to unite the people after the death of Solomon? What did they need? Wisdom. Counsel. They needed a wise counsel. So what is the hope that this child brings? Now we're back to Isaiah 9. What is the hope that this child brings? It's not just counsel. It's not just that this child would listen and receive wisdom. This text says that the child who would be born is the embodiment of wisdom. That he would be a one, not just a counselor, but a wonderful counselor. Wouldn't it have been great if on the day of Jeroboam and Rehoboam, the old dudes gave good counsel and the young dudes came and they gave, gave, gave counsel and what would have been said? This is wonderful, right? It's what you do when you experience something good. When you eat good food, you say, man, this is great. This is wonderful. If your turkey this past Thanksgiving was not dry, what did you say? This is wonderful, Right? I make gumbo because I'm from Louisiana. My wife said, well, I wish she would have said the gumbo was wonderful. And she said it was the best gumbo I've ever made. And I thought it was wonderful, right? Because it was beneficial to people. It was helpful. And we've been eating it for the last three days. And I have none to share with you people. <laughs> this text says that the child will be the embodiment of wisdom. That this child will unite, and here's the hope, that this child will unite. The very first words in this list, that he would be the one to unite the people of God and hold them together in wisdom. You see what's different with this first name than the other names in Isaiah 9, 6, as I've said, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. They all tell us what this child will be over the people of God. But Wonderful Counselor tells us what this child will be in the midst of the people of God. And that's why it comes first. You know what makes a good counselor so good? A good counselor is able to take good and helpful truths over your life and embody them in such a way that it changes you from the inside out. It comes to your life and it changes you from the inside out because you say, hey, this wisdom is so good and so helpful and so specific that I, I think this counselor is not just giving me some idea off of the words of a page, but that he's got his eye specifically on me in my situation. And the advice and the wisdom he's giving to me is like it's tailor-made just for me in my unique situation in life where I am right now. That's what makes a good counselor. All right, Psalm 32, 8. Um, maybe we could throw it up on the screen. Let's see. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. And what's the second half of that? I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Now, there are some in this room, and some maybe who are listening online, and they'll say, well, uh, this child in Isaiah 9, 6 was fulfilled with Ahaz's son, Hezekiah. Okay, now I'm not going to go too far into this, but some will say that Christians have over-dramatized this scripture uh, of Isaiah 9 that we're going to spend the next month. They're going to say, y'all have taken it too far. You want to apply it to your Jesus. This actually applies to Hezekiah. And they will say what happens later on in Hezekiah. Now get this crazy story. All right, this is an insane story. Hezekiah is being attacked by the Assyrian army. Okay, he's, he's leading uh, Israel, he's being attacked by the Assyrian army, and 185,000 warriors come, and they, in, they encircle the city, which today would be like the equivalent of 3 million warriors. Hezekiah didn't even know about it. They go to sleep, and an angel of the Lord comes and wipes them all out. 185,000. They wake up the next day, didn't even know anything happened. And those who uh, would hold to Judaism and not Christianity would say, there's your wonderful counselor. Well, my response to that is, what counsel actually took place? The dude was sleeping, right? Yes, it was a wonderful event. Yeah, it's up there with like the exodus from Egypt. I mean, that's a pretty wonderful event. This is pretty amazing. But you know what? Hezekiah, you know when he turns to the Lord? When he's on his deathbed. He's about to die. Yeah, he was a good king. 
but he turns to the Lord on his deathbed. He didn't live and establish a whole life of godliness like Isaiah 9 talks about. And do you want to know how he ends his life? Isaiah 39 gives us a picture. Uh, he calls to, the, to Babylon, and the king of Babylon sends, an invo- uh, sends basically some, some messengers. And he's like, hey, guys, cool, good to see y'all. Y'all come on in. And he opens up the doors to his house, and he's like, hey, come check out my gold. Come check out my silver. Come check out my essential oils. Come check out my, my, uh, my guns. Come check out my knives. And, uh, and this is all awesome. Why don't you come check it out? And then Isaiah hears word. Isaiah comes walking in, and he sees all these people leave. And he's like, dude, would you just, who, who are those people? Oh, they're from Babylon. They're just buddies of mine. I just want to come show them some, some guns that I had. And Isaiah's like, wait a second. What'd you show them? Well, I showed them everything in the house. Bro, bro, you just showed a foreign power everything in your house and all the storehouses of Israel. What do you think they're going to do with that information? And what ends up happening? They go into exile into Babylon. I would not call that wonderful counselor, would you? Do all the parsing of the words and language you want. That does not fit the description. So I submit to you this morning that this wonderful counselor is found in the person and work of Jesus of Nazareth. This wonderful counselor is none other than Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus brings to climax the wisdom of Solomon and all the wise men of Israel. He is the wonderful counselor. He fulfills all that was foretold by the prophets of Israel All the wise rule of the messianic promise. He comes as the God man in whom all the wisdom of God perfectly relates to the wisdom of man. And Colossians 1 tells us that all things are reconciled to God through Jesus. And we've seen in our series, we're in the uh, Sermon on the Mount uh, the last few weeks. And we've seen in the Sermon on the Mount the last two months, Jesus goes toe-to-toe with the wisdom of Israel. You've heard it said, blah, 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 but I say to you, here it is, right? What do you think Jesus is doing? He's the embodiment of wisdom coming to the people of God. And when we get back to the Sermon on the Mount in 2021 or 2022, I don't know when we're doing it, 2021, you're going to see him use parables to confront the leaders of Israel and the false wisdom that pervaded their day. And the New Testament even goes so far to say that for all who believes, God makes Jesus our wisdom. He makes Jesus wisdom to us, 1 Corinthians 1.30 will say. And the fact that Jesus fulfills wisdom means that the gospel presents to us not just a, fact, a set of facts to believe, but a whole new way of looking at the world. He presents to us a whole new hope, a whole new reality. And the good news of Jesus is that God restores relationships, but he also reveals to us a whole new reality. Uh, again, I'll ask you, you know how you can tell that you're in front of a good counselor? Um, I, I, uh, <clears throat> I pastored a, a church in Pennsylvania, got out of the ministry for, for a little bit, and um, as kind of the, the ticket of, hey, let's help you, Stephen, is, let's get you in front of a counselor. And so my wife and I went and met with a counselor, and I was the, the hard, hardest person in that room. Like, that guy was there to help me, and my wife was there to help me, and everything that guy said to me, wall, defense. I didn't want to hear it. I didn't want anything to do with the help he was offering me. And that was the darkest season of my life. But do do, do you know what ended up up breaking down? Was I realized that this guy was taking truths over my life. He had also gone through that experience probably 20 years before. He was an old gray-haired dude. Look, this is 1 Kings. I should have read that, right? And, And he was embodying that truth and entering into my life. And speaking that truth to me. And the hope and the foundation is rooted in the reality, not of me and my experience. But the hope and the foundation was rooted in the reality and the goodness of that counselor coming into my life. And could change me. Someone from the outside who could come in and 
and begin to work on my heart and change the wounds and heal the brokenness of my heart. Now, I've, I've followed this Jesus guy for uh, a good part of, of three decades now, and I've, I've seen a lot uh, with the church. I've seen good, I've seen bad, I've seen ugly. And uh, the one thing that is so cool to see over the years, and I'm not, I've never gotten tired of it, is seeing how Jesus brings together people who are radically different and would never have anything in common except for Jesus. It's amazing to me to see how Jesus holds together the people of God. I, uh, I led a, a missional community, or what we call as a neighborhood group once, and uh, I, was, I was realizing like we were on the verge of just collecting information. And I didn't want that. I want us to, to unite and, and actually begin to form a sticky family. And so I threw out the task that day was, hey, for the next couple months, I want you just to go have dinner with someone else in this group you've never had dinner with, and I want you just to uh, tell stories. Well, uh, that was in Huntsville, Alabama. One out of 13 people is a rocket scientist in Huntsville, and I didn't realize um, when you throw out a task to a room full of engineers, there needed to be a spreadsheet as well, and there needed to be processes and steps, and so the, the barrage of questions, just like, how are we going to do this? And you know what? I just put my hand on my ass. And I remember, I was still like, kind of like maybe a year or so after pastoring. I'm just, I said, figure it out. <laughs> Here, do you have a phone? Take a phone. You got your phone? Cool. Call them. Call them. Great. Now you have each other's phone numbers. Okay. Now on Tuesday, you're going to pick up the phone and you're going to call them and you're going to meet up. Oh, okay. Wow. Problem solved. We fixed it. Great. So we got that off the ground. The next two months happens. And we come back after two months. And uh, I come and check in with people along the way. And after two months, uh, I sit there, and we've all had dinner together. Everybody, everybody in the group. There's probably about 12, 15 of us. And so we imagine, imagine we, we pulled that off. And I said, so what would you learn? And everybody in that room said, you know what? We are all so different. We might do the same kind of jobs. We all got the same kind of backgrounds. And we would talk about things for a little bit. And then we just throw out the question of, how would you meet the Lord? And next thing we knew... It was past our kids' bedtime. We were up talking so much about Jesus and what he's done to change us and who he is and the, the wonderfulness of the gospel and how he met us in our brokenness and just one after another. And, and here was the great win. Spoiler alert. What united all of us was Jesus. <laughs> and that's the point of our neighborhood groups. Not just to simply say, okay, let's cool, let's have another event. It's let's see how deep this actually goes with our common experience of Jesus and see how that can spill out in everyday life. That, that is what amazes me. You can have, and, and it crosses ethnic backgrounds, it crosses racial backgrounds, it crosses uh, 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 financial backgrounds, it crosses ages. It's amazing to see what you can do when you just stick people in a room who have been changed by Jesus and just hear them talk about how wonderful he is. They just don't stop talking about him. And if you're in this room today and you're not a Christian, you're like, well, why would I ever want to do that? Just listen. Get in a room with Christians and listen to them talk about Jesus. It's not just that he's a counselor. He's a what? He's a wonderful counselor. It's not just that he's God. He's a mighty God. Have you seen the things he's done in my life? I have jacked up my life so much, it would only take an act of might to do this. He's, an, he's not just a father. He's an everlasting father. He sticks around. He's not just a prince. He's a prince of shalom, of the way that things ought to be. He's a prince of peace. It's amazing, and Jesus has his eye on each of us. It's so specific. It's like his wisdom is tailor-made for each of us in our own specific situation. So this word wonderful, it shows up. If you know the story of the Old Testament, you've got a guy named Samson, okay? Um, now that was a dude right there. Samson, strong, really, really strong guy, okay? Uh, before he's born, his parents are visited by an angel. And the angel comes to them, they have a little conversation with him, and uh, 
and um, Samson's dad's name was uh, Manoah. Manoah. Manoah says to the angel of the Lord, he says, what's your name? <laughs> and the angel says to him, why do you ask me my name? It's too wonderful for you. And all of a sudden, something crazy happens with this angel. He goes up in heaven, and, uh, and Samson's mom and dad look at each other and like, they fall on their face on the ground. And Samson's dad says to Samson's mom, surely we're about to die. Because what we have seen can only be explained as the face of God. It is too wonderful for our understanding. So what's wonderful about Jesus isn't that I understand him. It's that he understands me. It isn't that we together can get a handle on him. It's that he by himself knows all of us, all of us as the people of God, and he yet still holds us together as one. That he would enter into a world not as a grown adult, but born as a child in a common birth among family. And as he would enter that mission, not just to accomplish a work of dying on the cross and raising from the dead, which would be wonderful enough, but it was even more wonderful that he would hold together the people of God, that he would define the people of God, and that he would so unite the people of God by truly understanding us from the inside out. He would truly understand you in your own unique situation. Think about this. Of all the situations that God could have come, and as we long and wait for him, think about what he does. Jesus is born into a really shaky family, right? Mary, the virgin, he's born the virgin birth. No one believes it. Joseph, his dad, is around for a little bit. We don't really know exactly what's going on as far as uh, what, uh, Joseph, how Joseph's life played out. Most church historians would say Joseph died. So Jesus grows up in a single mom household. And you know what all the kids would say about him at recess and on the slide? Bastard. Yeah. And you know that name would stick with him all throughout his childhood? And growing up, and then Jesus would start to do miracles. And at one point, Jesus starts to do miracles, and his mother and his own brother think he's lost his ever loving mind. So, no, Dad, you got a name cast down upon you. Unbelief of family. Jesus gets his best buds, and he decides, I'm going to reveal my glory to these guys right here. Peter, James, John. He takes them up to a mountain. All of a sudden, he reveals his glory. Elijah uh, shows up, and, and Peter's like, oh, let's throw up some tents here. This is awesome, man. This is, this is what it's all about. Yes, this is it. The kingdom of God's here. And, and uh, a voice of God, the audible voice of God comes down and says, this is my beloved son, not a bastard. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. They go down the mountain, and all of a sudden, you know what happens? Oh, you of little faith. Jesus, we got all these people here. How, what are we going to do? How are we going to feed them, Jesus? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> do, you not, do you just not remember? This is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Oh, you of little faith. And these are the experiences in which Jesus will go through for his people. And Jesus will go to the cross. And he will know not just his death. Don't just think he's going to die on a cross. He's going to absorb the wrath of God. That was due on the people of God. And he would lay there in a garden. And he would not just cry to his father. But the Bible says that he, he sweat drops of blood coming down from his face. And he would say, Father, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours. Do you know at that point... I would say, do you realize it has been not my will but yours for long enough? But what is Jesus? He's taken the truths of the goodness of God and he's entered into our specific situation to go bear the brunt of the wrath of God for all those who would believe. And then he's on the cross and his, his best friends all abandon him. And he dies Three days later, he raises from the dead to be vindicated 
And I can tell you now that if you will so take Jesus as this wonderful counselor, his story, his entering into your story, will be yours as well. You've been abused, you've been abandoned, you've been neglected, you've been wronged, you've experienced injustice. Cling to him, put your hope in him, unite by faith to him, and what happened to him will, the Bible says, also be the end of your story. And I know no, no better counsel than to give you than, hey, whatever it is you're going through, that crummy marriage, whatever it is that's going through, God had a crummy marriage for all of history. And he stuck it through. Get some wise counsel, yes. But he knows what it's like. He, he'll, he's entered into your story. And if you'll just trust him, there's glory on the other side. There's vindication on the other side. There's justification that's happened now by faith. And one day, the Bible says, the glory of the Son of God will be revealed. And we will get to see him face to face. So I'll close with the quote I read as we began today. God truly understands you from inside your experience. There is no other religion that says God has suffered, that God had to be courageous, that he knows what it's like to be abandoned by friends, to be crushed by injustice, to be tortured and die. Christmas, Advent, shows us that God knows what you're going through when you take to him, he understands. Would you, in hope of this reality, take to him today as the wonderful counselor that he is? Let's pray. Father, so good to know that you have so much hope for us bound up in Four little titles, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And we pray that, Lord, these four titles would help us to know you more and to know that we can be known as a people. And so would you do that work through us, to us, for your glory over the next few weeks as we get into uh, these truths we thank you, Lord, for the rock-solid hope that Jesus' future is our future and that we do have a hope in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.